The years 1966 and 67 marked a peak in scale production, but this was not to last. Richard Lines, former director of Triang and now with Hornby Hobbies, tells us about the decline in sales. They went steadily downwards uh, through 68 and uh, they bottomed out in 1971 and then started to climb steadily after that. How badly were sales affected? Well, from the peak, uh, it went down by, I think we were down to about 60% of what we had done by 71, which was quite a serious amount. Did the competition fare better or worse than Scalextric? It's rather difficult to say because the, the, the trouble was caused by a plethora of cars like Hot Wheels, which weren't direct competitors, but they were all part of the model vehicle market. And these things came in, into the country from different directions. And they affected all toys. I mean, Scalextric wasn't the only one to be affected. It affected trains and every other toy you could think of. But like a, a normal gimmick, it, it had its day, and then it disappeared again fairly quickly. But it did a lot of damage in the process. Innovation such as the U-Steer range intended to compete with these toys had little effect. And in 1970, the Scalextric factory in Havant was forced to close its doors and the company relocated the already established Hornby plant at Margate, which was larger and, as a manufacturer of model railways, already housed many of the facilities necessary for plastic model production. A tour around the factory shows that it has changed very little since those early days. Even this was not enough, however, as the company was battling against a declining interest in slot car racing and an economy which was in a disastrously weak state. The Heath administration was overseeing what was arguably the worst period of industrial unrest since 1926, and figures released in November of that year revealed that 8.8 .8 million man-hours had been lost in England through strike action. In August of 1971, Scalextric was bought by the Dunby Convex Marx Group. Well, DCM was a very progressive, quite young toy group, uh, very expansionist-minded. And when they saw that Scalextric and Hornby were um, available for sale, they collected all their piggy banks together and rushed in and bought it very wisely. Were any changes made to the running of the company? No, they, they left us very much to our own devices. Uh, we. we managed to get a new managing director. It took us two or three years to train him up properly. But uh, no, I, I think that the, the basic systems that we use were, were left more or less untouched. The costs involved in producing the 33 cars, 30 types of track section, and the 52 accessories available in the 1967 catalog were inordinate. And although a range of this size was wonderful for the collector, the expense required to tool, mould, store and distribute the models needed to be offset against high sales volumes, and this was just not happening. The number of models in the range was drastically reduced. Why did this happen? Yes, if you can imagine, take an imaginary 100,000 vehicles. If you were going to make 100,000 vehicles in a year, and you had, I think, 32 different varieties, it would mean you were only going to make about 3,000 of each, which was not an economic quantity. So we steadily cut it back, and I think we came down to about 18, uh, which meant that we got a, a reasonable production run of each of them. And uh, the market wasn't particularly fussed by this reduction. Which models in particular were discontinued? Well, when you're knocking items out of a range, you, you carefully pick the ones that sell least numbers. And up into the late 60s, we still had a few of the original cars, original Lotus and I think the D-type Jaguar and things like that. They were the first to go because people had all got them. And we also took out the, the vintage cars because although they were attractive, they, they weren't big sellers. The track accessories disappeared almost completely and although they were by no means necessary to the functioning of Scalextric, some of the magic of the toy inevitably went with them. The catalogues from the early part of the period show very few models, and some of these are quite poor in quality. 
but notably in 1970, Scalextric brought the moulds for the Triumph TR-4A and Sunbeam Tiger back to England from Hong Kong. These two cars have become difficult to find in mint condition, and so command a high price. Changes in the motors used was a continuous theme, as more and more models began to include small can motors. Richard Lines explains the reasons behind this. Basically because the RX motor, the original motor, was very expensive to make, uh, relatively. Um, we had, we explored all sorts of varieties of motor. We had three different sources of supply. Um, they were all a bit variable, but uh, in a way, scale extra is only a reflection of the real car market, that you, you get all sorts of varieties of motors in, uh, in a modern, a modern car of different horsepowers and so on. And, uh, I think we were rather in the same game. Why was the Mabuchi motor introduced? Uh, as far as I remember, we arranged to have four cars made in Hong Kong in the 60s, the intention being that they could be made there and sold direct to Australia and America without having to come to England, uh, all in the interest of saving money. And I think those cars were the first to use uh, can motors. Uh, the cars weren't all that good, but the motors were quite, quite satisfactory, and so we took them on afterwards. Some collectors have noticed that certain models feature a faster version of the motor. Was this deliberate? Well, I think that that reflects the fact that we had different sources of supply. Um, generally speaking, any, any motor will go faster than you can drive a car, and the only reason you can determine the difference really is when it's acceleration. But I don't think we were all that fussy about it. We wanted reliable motors that were um, giving a good performance. And uh, if some were better than others, that was just a bit of a coincidence. Sales continued to be nothing more than steady in the early part of the decade. But Scalextric's reputation and continued presence in the public eye ensured that the company not only survived, but thrived as interest in slot car racing began to resurface. Any attempt to simply list all the models produced from 1970 onwards would be futile, simply because of the sheer numbers involved. And so this programme will mainly deal with those which for various reasons have become of interest to the collector. The Porsche 917, catalogued as C22, was only available in England for one year after the publication of the 1973 catalogue, and so is quite rare in the UK. But in France, it continued to be produced for 12 years, so any astute collector could obtain one quite easily from abroad. The C17 Lamborghini was also first produced in this year, and some collectors may have come across a poor quality version of this model in pale yellow. This was actually manufactured under license in the USSR by Novo and was only intended for sale behind the Iron Curtain, but quite a large number found their way onto market stalls in the UK and proved to be somewhat of an embarrassment to Hornby. Scalextric has always been up with events in the real motor racing world and in 1973 released its representation of what was possibly the best known formula racing car of its day, the John Player Special Lotus. The first version, the C50 Lotus 72, originally raced as number eight, but in 1975 this was changed to number one to reflect the team's success on the racing circuit. C126 Lotus 77 took up the colors in catalog 18, but its livery very soon became subject to a change. I think there was a time in the 70s when people were coming very anti-smoking, or some people were, and uh, it was felt that we didn't want to upset anybody, so uh, we changed the liveries um, to keep the peace. The model continued with Team Lotus and Olympus liveries. The C129 March 240, released later in 1978, illustrated experiments which were taking place on the track with six-wheel cars. The racing team was sponsored by Rothmans, and so this model also bore a livery advertising tobacco products. By the next catalogue, this had been dropped in favour of a simple March livery. 
and the car became available in both blue and green. Consequently, the earlier versions of both the March and the Lotus have become collectible. Formula One cars have always been popular with slot car racers, especially those driven to success by the stars of the track, and the 70s were not to prove a disappointment with the release of three cars, Nicky Lauda's Ferrari 3121 and Jackie Stewart's Tyrrell 007 in 1976, and in 1977, James Hunt's McLaren M23. The success of these drivers must have done wonders for Scalextric sales. The 70s also saw the birth of some of the dynastic ranges of cars. The Ford Escort has undergone many changes and started in 1975 with the C52 Escort Mexico. The TR7 was born in Catalogue 19 and the popularity of both these models reflected that of their full-size counterparts on the car market. By 1980, Scalextric certainly was the big one and was trading very well despite the difficulties being experienced by the rest of the DCM group. Yes, so the, the company had a bit of a problem in 1980 because the parent company, DCM, had rather overstretched themselves. And the effect of this was that they went into receivership and that we were taken into receivership with them. Uh, this didn't actually affect the product or the development or the sale of it. It was a, it was a financial problem that was uh, overcome fairly readily. And uh, I don't believe the man in the street was really aware that it happened at all. Good sales meant that many of the old accessories were reintroduced to the track and innovative electronic devices promised to give a new dimension in realism to slot racing. But the think tank, soundtrack and fuel tank did not do well and the fuel tank was particularly disappointing. The idea was wonderful, as each driver was forced to make the crucial decision on how much fuel he'd put into his car, and the model's performance reflected this choice. Too much, and the car would be sluggish. Too little, and it would slow to a halt on the final straight. Unfortunately, it was only set up for the small oval or figure eight track, and so on any larger setup, the models would sometimes barely complete a lap. The drama and tension of high-speed endurance racing returned to the system with the reappearance of lit cars in Catalogue 21. C118 and C119, the black Escort and green Porsche, both with gold coach lines, are the most collectible since they've stayed in production for only about a year before the colours were changed and more elaborate livery added. For the first time in 10 years, motorcycle combinations became available in 1980. The red combo catalogued as C281 and the green as C282. The bikes handled very poorly and were not popular. Children must have found them particularly difficult to control. Even so, they're still relatively easy to find today, although their penchant for flying off the circuit at every corner means that many are in a poor condition. Accidental or incidental, it's not certain why the early production runs of the C115 Porsche Turbo 935 had the roof stripes running in a different direction to those shown in the catalogue. But later models corrected the error, and this model variation has now become a classic part of Scalextric history. Interestingly, another error is to be seen on the Porsche 935. This time on catalogue number C125, released two years later, where the word Porsche is incorrectly spelt on the underpan, mirroring an earlier spelling mistake made in the 1961 catalogue. The 1981 catalogue was unusual in that it was presented in the form of a comic book in which many of the products listed are to be seen involved in the fight for the force of good. It contained a number of interesting models. C284 Police Rover was the first of three police rovers to be released by Hornby. The second was C315 in 1984, and the third, C362, was first produced in 1985 and enjoyed a long life. The second one is by far the rarer of the three, having only been issued for a year, but all three have working lights and sirens and surely deserve a place in any collection. The 
The two Super Stocks cars C285 Stick Shifter and C286 Fender Bender, released in 1981, had terrific play value, with an innovative guide mechanism which allowed the cars to spin around on the track and head off in the other direction. It did not even require a different hand throttle. These two models are relatively common, but two others, one in silver and the other in gold, are less so. Other issues of that year were the silver and gold Porsches, C288 and C289. These have proved to be very popular. Two classic cars were reintroduced for the 23rd catalogue, C305 Bentley and C306 Alfa Romeo. They basically used the same moulds as the originals, but had different motors and guides fitted. More important, though, was the later issue of a limited edition of red alpha body shells for the National Scale Extra Collectors Club. The idea was that the collector took the guts out of the fairly common blue alpha and fitted them to the rarer model. Since only about 80 of the red alpha Romeos were made, they command a high price. Metros have become one of the bread and butter cars for Scale Extric since they first began in 1982 with the C303 McCain and C304 data post liveries and hardly a year goes by without new colours being added to the range. This year also witnessed the last new Formula One card to be released for five years with the Parmalat Brabham. Instead, Hornby issued old mouldings with new colours and consequently some of these have become quite rare due to low sales. The models also began to be issued in bubble packs to cut costs and very few of these remain with their packaging intact. Interestingly, a small number of C359 track champs are to be found in a darker blue than the original issue of 1984. This may have been due to an urgent second production run The Knights of the Road roared onto the tracks with the introduction in 1982 of two articulated lorries, C301 Road Train and C302 Low Loader. The catalogue illustrates the gearing used, but it would appear that the motor fitted to the prototypes was different to that used in the actual models, which instead was a Mabuchi small can. Two years later, the wheelbases on the cabs were extended and extra trim added to create Rebel Rig and Night Raider, the two racing rigs. Two more cabs, which were strictly for the racers, were issued in 1987. Based on the old mouldings, these are C387 and 388. The last truck was the T45 Leyland. Despite terrific play value, the trucks were not good sellers, maybe because they were in a different scale to the rest of the scale extrix range. Whatever the reason, the trucks are now quite difficult to find, especially with all the chrome trimmings which are so delicate that most racers don't even fit them to the models. The rarest of them all is the C335 Parmalat Road Train introduced in 1984. It's quite a bland looking model and did not sell well. There was very little of interest in the 1983 catalogue, except that the first of the XR3 and Capris entered the range. Also new was the Daredevil Loop, but this sold quite poorly and is not particularly sought after now. Even so, 1983 was a landmark year for the series collector. After seeing them on a factory tour the year before, collector Steve de Havilland persuaded Hornby to part with some white Bugatti body tops, which had been made to test if their original Bugatti moulds were still in working order, so that if they wished, Hornby could add them to the range of reissued classics along with the Bentley and Alpha. By August, 120 red bodies were available, and by November, 90 each of yellow and green had joined them. It was intended that the collector should put together the rest of the model by using reproduction parts, and so they are to be seen with a variety of different wheel colours, as well as the silver of the originals. These models are exceptionally rare. The rarest of all, the affectionately titled de Havilland Bugattis, however, is the original white model of which only 21 are thought to exist. On the very few occasions when this model comes up for sale, it commands a premium price. 
About the same time, white auto union body tops also became available. But seeing as the original model was also available in white, these do not fetch the prices of the Bugattis. A new Marshall's car became available in Catalog 25. These are quite rare and are especially hard to find with the flag still attached to the roof. The Melita Metro was also released and that too is becoming quite collectible. Track Busters was the action special for 1984. It contained two Datsun 4x4s, each of which had a spring-operated mechanism underneath, which was activated when the trailing racer rammed the leading 4x4 in the rear. This threw the truck off the track, giving the ramming truck a clear route to victory. The Turnco Metro, number C360, is quite a collectible. Released in 1985, it did not stay in production for long. The television series on which it was based was not a success, and apparently Hornby had problems tampo printing the yellow colour around the windows. It is 1986 before the next two models of interest were released. The first of these is the C143 BMW 3-litre CSL. This car was only available in an action special flying leap set, and so inevitably most of these models had very short lives. Only a few of these attractive models are to be found in mint condition and are particularly sought after. The second is another limited edition for the NSCC, this time a grey Datsun 260Z. 260 of these were made in two production runs, the first having black bumpers and the later ones chrome. In 1987, Scalextric recognised the prominence of two drivers on the Formula One circuit with the release of Ayrton Senna's Lotus Renault C373 and Nigel Mansell's Williams Honda C374. These two models mark the end of a five-year wilderness in Formula One production. Nineteen eighty-eight was a year of big breakthroughs for Scalextric. Magnatraction, the simple addition of magnets to the underside of the models to aid road handling, was adopted from the Hornby 00 gauge railways and has proved very popular. A simulated turbo flash was also added to the Lotus Renault and Williams Honda, which were given the new numbers C425 and C426. The C434 Lotus Honda was also added to the range of Formula One cars. This last model was not available in the UK without turbo flash, although some Australian versions which do not feature this realistic effect have become available to the collector. This year also saw the introduction of the world sports car range, with C382 Jaguar XJ8 and C436 Porsche 963. There's nothing special about these models except for their wonderful road handling, which assured their popularity. Also for the racers was the new Super Racing System, a collection of exceptionally lightweight cars fitted with potent motors and guide, gears and wheels which could be adjusted to suit each individual track. These cars race exceptionally well, but their somewhat ugly appearance makes them unpopular with the collector. The Mighty Metro set was the new bottom-of-the-range product, a budget set with simple track layout and two fine examples of the Metro range. It was an affordable product, making Scalextric accessible to most families. For some, it would be the only Scalextric set they would ever own, but for others, it would herald the beginning of a long love affair with the system. Catalogue 30 contains some fine examples, including the first of the Cosworth range. The front cover shows the astuteness of Hornby's marketing team. The popular English driver Nigel Mansell had just left Williams to join the Ferrari team, and both cars were illustrated to advertise the new C457 Ferrari F1 car. New collectors may find models which they cannot place in any Scalextric catalogue, and it's more than likely that these are foreign-produced cars. Four sets of cars of note have been released in Australia. 
the first in 1984 being the Green Rover and white XR3i. In 1986, the C375 and six XR3i's with Palmer tube mills and mobile livery were issued. In 1988, the Bob Jane and Redcoat Pontiacs were issued in response to the Bathurst racing craze. And finally, in 1990, two Cosworths became available, one with Shell livery and the other with Mobile. Although all four sets were common in Australia, they're very collectible in the UK. Another source of confusion could be models that were produced in Spain. Although they were not actually made by Hornby, they were completely compatible with the system and they're noted for their fine modeling and exciting liveries. Other oddities to look out for are models made from clear plastic. They're the result of test runs by the factory to examine how the plastic will flow in new molds. A few models were made in a silver or gold colour and then mounted to be used for special promotions or as trophies. These make interesting additions to any collection. It's notable that some models which were advertised in the Scalextric catalogue either never made it to the shops or were released with a different livery to that shown. The Tyrrell 4 002 listed in catalogues 14 and 15 and given number C048 was wrongly labelled C047 in catalogue 14 and then never appeared as the Spanish made model was unsuitable for the standard guide and motor used in the UK at the time. It was though available in Spain for some years. In catalogue 27 two Sierra XR4i's C333 and C334 are illustrated but the model was withdrawn before tooling started and were eventually issued in 1989 as Ford Sierra RS Cosworths. Catalogue 27 shows C380, the Datsun 260Z with Bison computers livery in white, but the decision was made to change the colour to metallic green. A few white ones were produced, however, and these are sought after items. 1987 promised a revised computer vision Metro 6R4 to replace C149, but this was not proceeded with following changes to rallying rules which would have reduced the real car's racing eligibility. C430, the Lancia Delta shown in the 1988 catalogue, was not thought to be suitable for scaling down to 132nd scale. The model only reached the prototype stage and no models exist. The C461 McLaren Honda shown on the cover of Catalogue 31 was abandoned after permission was refused for Hornby to issue the model as it was felt that it would promote cigarette advertising to the young. McLaren sponsors Marlboro were reportedly anxious to prevent the production of any car which showed their trademarks. Models bearing the livery were made in Spain, however, and these can be obtained by collectors. A change in the real car's sponsors in the closed season prompted Tyrrell Marketing to persuade Hornby to produce the up-to-date livery Epson PIAA on the Tyrrell Ford 018, rather than that shown in the catalogue. The model was released as the Tyrrell Ford 019. A supplementary brochure published in 1983 promised the imminent release of System Plus. It never reached the shops. It also illustrated the up-and-coming Spider-Man set, showing the cars in yellow and white. They actually appeared in yellow and red. The new decade was celebrated once again with the introduction of motorcycle combinations. C238 Racing Red and C239 Yellow Flash. The addition of magnet traction meant that unlike their predecessors, these models handled very well on the track and consequently proved popular with racers. The big action special of 1990 was the Batman set. The C465 Batmobile was an accurate representation of that driven by the caped crusader in the popular feature film. 
and the C-466 Joker's Porsche was a relivery of an existing moulding. Unfortunately, the time needed to create a new model and obtain a licence from the film's producers meant that Hornby were a little late to take full advantage of the merchandise fever which followed the film's premiere. To commemorate its success on the 24-hour endurance circuit, the C468 Sauber Mercedes became featured in Catalogue 31, as did the C461 Ford Benetton, a beautifully liveried Formula One car. In 1991, a completely new range was featured, with horse racing as its theme. Endorsed by the jockey Willie Carson, two sets were available, C945 Ascot and C944 Newmarket. Each had a simulated turf track and a humped back bridge, and the new market set had a clipped together grandstand and figures included. Two horses were available separately in 1991, C129 Chestnut Horse, Tim's Folly, and C128 Dapple Grey Horse, Fairweather Lady. Two others joined them in 1992, called C419 Terry's Challenge Sulky No. 3 and C420 Julie's Choice Sulky No. 4. Although the move to the turf was not universally accepted, it may well mark the beginning of a whole new departure for Hornby. Turtle fever hit Britain in 1991, and Scalextric played its part with the release of three sets, C400 Turtle Power, C-401, Turtles to the Rescue, and C-454, Shredder's Revenge, and all the figures became available separately in the same year. The comical superheroes C-130 Leonardo, C-131 Donatello, C-132 Raphael, and C-388 Michelangelo were featured riding powered skateboards and their adversaries were C-339 Foot Soldier and C-134 Shredder. The Shredder figure was discontinued after 1991 and may prove to be a collectible item in years to come. Two novelty vehicles, C-422 Turtle Pickup and C-421 Party Wagon completed the range. Previously, cars with lights had only been lit when they were running, since power was supplied to the lights via the hand throttle. Permalite allowed the lights to be turned on or off independently, and the first set to include this feature was the C650 Alpine Rally set. Racers could even flash their lights at their opponents as they streaked past them. X cars were a new collection of budget models. Based on the idea of experimental vehicles used in the motor industry which had all their unnecessary parts stripped off, these were no trimmings cars which took the system into the pocket money market. Another classic error was made this year as a number of C409 BMW M3 Demon Tweaks models became available with the figure tampo printed the wrong way round on the roof. The dream car for Catalogue 32 was C411 Lamborghini Diablo, which was joined in the following year by the C310 Ferrari F40. C321 Ford XR2i was the first of what could become another dynastic range for Hornby. To complement the BBC television series of the same name, Catalogue 33 launched The Power and the Glory a range of re-releases of classic cars from the past. They were C093 Tyrrell Ford 007, C094 Ferrari 312B, C095 Ford 3L, C096 Ferrari P4, C097 Van Wall, C098 BRM, C099 Mini Cooper, C305 Bentley, and C306 Alfa Romeo. Where possible, they had new motors and guides fitted. Some collectors have shown concern over the effect that these reissues will have on the prices of the originals. 
We asked model dealer Mike Savage and Hornby's Richard Lines their opinions on this series. Um, it's a good idea, but it will deteriorate from the older ones. From people that actually collect, um, it will deteriorate um, some of the value, I should imagine, from some of the older cars. Um, it's a good idea, but I don't think the racers will use them somehow. Oh, I think on the contrary, I think they will probably in, in, improve the uh, attractiveness of the originals. And because the two are readily identifiable, um, there's no problem in uh, somebody persuading somebody else that it was an old one. It's obviously not going to be an old one. The multi-level circuit first introduced in 1991 added a new dimension for Scalextric racers. Also in the 90s, the first major change to the guide system for a decade was made with the introduction of easy-fit guides, which had ready-fitted braids and spare eyelets included. 1991 saw the first limited edition made by Hornby to be marked as such on the box. The MG Maestros. Commissioned by Steve de Havilland, only two of the five car set, the C275 in black and C276 in red, actually came in packaging. The others being sold unboxed like previous special editions. Although it's difficult to say exactly how many were made, numbers were low, so the models are bound to rise in value within a relatively short time. Not all Scalextric models are of interest to the collector, so what is it that makes one model valuable whilst another barely commands the price of a new issue? Well, there's a, there are a few factors, I suppose. Really, the number produced, if they've only made, shall we say, 1,000 of a model, and obviously that will be hard to find in the future. Secondly, a card that's really nice and everybody wants and wants to play with. Of course, they don't laugh, they're not die cast, they're only plastic. So that wouldn't last for the future, so that would become collectible. And thirdly, the car that nobody wants, I won't say what they're going to be, because I wouldn't know at the moment, but cars that nobody wants, they will become collectible, collectible in the future. Since Skelextric is fundamentally a toy, it's not surprising that many models soon suffer severe damage, particularly those featured in action specials. These can quite often acquire a value simply because of the few mint models which are available. Often, parts can be salvaged from damaged models to put together a complete mint example, such as the chrome on the trucks and the tailgate on the low loader. Short production runs have led to a number of valuable models, and special editions are obviously collectible. These two TR7s, for example, were only sold through the retail toy store Toys R Us. When it became known that these models existed, collectors rushed to acquire them. Certain models are just not appealing to the customer, or, like the Turtles, were released too late to really take advantage of the market. Therefore, these models are bound to be rare in years to come, giving them a value never imagined when they were new. In some cases, it may only be one colour, such as the red BRM on the right, or a slight difference in the modelling, which makes the difference. In this case, the version on the left with down headlamps is the rarer. For whatever reason, the yellow Spider-Man TR7 featuring only half a figure is rarer than the one showing the full body of the superhero. Factory errors also produce models which are of interest to the collector. The stripes on the left-hand model were printed incorrectly. Consequently, it commands a higher price than the normal version. Sometimes the difference is very subtle. The common UK version of the Sierra Cosworth features a Fletcher's steel motif, whilst the much rarer Australian release advertises Palmer's tube mills. Since some cars have given birth to a whole family bearing different liveries, what difficulty is there for the collector in putting together the full range? Well, there are quite a lot of difficulties. I suppose the main one being that because Skeletric is a plastic toy, not die cast, then of course they don't stand the test of time. That's one of the main difficulties. Also, the number of changes on some of the Skeletric models. And there are so many on some models that it would take a lot of routing around in toy fairs and at car boot fairs trying to find these models. But I'm sure with time and with money, you'll be able to get most of them. 
Despite all the changes and innovations listed in these two programs, the Scalextric system has actually changed very little since its first introduction. Consequently, all the cars produced can be run on the newest track. The smallest set can soon develop into a collection including hundreds of models. Well, it's deliberate. One of the important things about Scalextric is that we, we always want everything to be compatible with what's gone in the past. Um, I think apart from the fact that we have had to change the resistance rating in the hand throttles from time to time, depending on the current motors, you can use any old Scalextric car on today's track, or, or any, old, any of today's track on old cars. It's a, it's a great thing, and it's, it's been fascinating how many fathers have told us that they've got their old set out of the loft and been delighted to find it still joins up. I think it's a great benefit, yes. What relevance will the collector have to the future of Scalextric? Well, we hear quite a lot from collectors, and uh, we're never quite sure how much we ought to be influenced by them. But we do take account of their needs, and we do a number of special little things for them. But uh, our prime business is supplying the toy market, and we, we have to be careful not to be over-influenced by, by loud voices. We love them. Other enthusiasts are more interested in racing their models than collecting them, and there are many clubs around the country which have been set up with just that aim in mind. Whether it be Formula One, Rally or Road Racing, Scalextric have a wide enough range to make it possible to emulate the stars of the track. Few homes could accommodate the impressive track layout set up by these bodies. And just the possibility of meeting other slot racing enthusiasts make them well worth joining. For many, Scalextric is more than just a toy. It's a serious sport, and at the highest levels, it takes some degree of skill to control the car at speed. Some racers have suggested that in order to be able to race the newer models, especially the world sports car range, effectively the track should be widened. Yes, I've heard this said. Um, we manage to race modern racing cars very happily when we are testing them and checking them here. Certainly they can knock, up, knock into the crash barriers on, on the edges of curves, but it doesn't stop you racing uh, and enjoying it. I mean, it, it might be an improvement, but it would be very difficult to do, especially if it wasn't compatible with what had gone before. The introduction of a new scale extric model is an involved process which can take many months before it even reaches the shop floor. The first thing we have to decide is the model's, what model's going to be. Uh, this usually takes a long time because there are different views. But once we've decided, we get all the reference material we can lay our hands on, uh, drawings, photographs, and other, that sort of information. And we'll make up a wooden model just to get the feel of it, to see that it looks right. Um, because obviously we have to do a bit of stretching and bending to, in order to it fit in with all the other cars. But when we're satisfied with that, we'll go into the drawing office where they do a fully detailed drawing of all the parts, uh, which can take some weeks. When that's done, we will make a proving model made exactly to the drawing, out of plastic. Um, this is put together and tested. Um, we always find there's little modifications to be made, which have to be turned back onto the drawings. When we're satisfied we've got that right, <clears throat> we'll make a, a pattern, a wooden pattern for the body, uh, maybe two or three times actual size. And from that, the moulds are made. Uh, when we get sample shots off the moulds, they're put together. And if we're lucky, the thing goes together first time. Occasionally, we have to do minor modifications, um, possibly incorporate a little bit more detail. But uh, after that, the job is, is ready to run. Um, there are some, some, of, some vehicles that need to have spray masks if we're going to decorate them specially and they're only made after the mouldings have been got, because otherwise the masks may not fit properly. But uh, th then we're ready to run. Have production techniques changed since 1970? Oh yes, I think that every, everything we do has changed. 
to a greater or lesser extent. Um, we've got a fair degree of automation. But automation is a funny thing. You can only automate things where you're making very large quantities. We are now able to make wheels and guide blades in particular uh, almost entirely automatically. And this is a great benefit because it did employ a lot of uh, labor making all these parts. Initially, the process used to manufacture both track and cars is very similar. Firstly, the components are injection molded from fine grains of clear plastic. Only a few grains of dye are necessary to obtain the required color for each type of model. Every item is checked by eye to ensure that only perfect pieces pass on to the next stage. Tampo printing is the process in which areas of color are printed onto the models. The flat plate at the rear is flooded with ink. The knife wipes away all the ink except where the plate has been etched with the exact shape of the design to be printed onto the model, to a depth of between two and five microns. The tampo rubber then picks this up and transfers the image onto the model. Because of the area which needs to be covered, it's not economical to print some models, and these are hand sprayed, the paint only covering the places which are exposed by the mask. Some components need to be given an all-over spray, and this is done on an automated system which spins the model while spraying from the top, bottom and one side. The parts go through an oven tunnel to dry and are then replaced with unpainted pieces by the operators. The track is completed by fitting metal inlays which carry the current to the cars and guide them around the layout during play. These inlays are stamped from a huge metal coil. There is surprisingly little waste left by this process. Some pieces of track take longer to finish than the simpler straight and curved sections. The crossover requires eight pieces of metal, which then have copper wires soldered to the underneath to maintain continuity of current. This is again done by hand to ensure the highest quality of connection. The cars themselves are also finished by hand. The wheels, the motor, magnets and lights being fitted to the underpan before the model is tested and the body shell fitted into place. The model is then tested again before it's packed, ready for shipping to the retailer. Alan Slade of the Mechatronics Department at Loughborough University is in the vanguard of those hoping to improve Scalextric's production techniques. What exactly is mechatronics? Everyone has their own definition of mechatronics. I tend to think, or tend to say, it's the integration of computer sciences, mechanical engineering, and electronics, with design as a sort of background thrown in as well, putting the four sciences or four areas together. How can the research taking place at Loughborough be advantageous to scale extric? Our major benefit is the fact that we can actually devote time to do an R&D work and improving the facilities they've got there and using mechatronics as their sort of byword behind it. They just haven't got the time or the resources to put into this. What particular development activity has Loughborough been involved with? Basically, with Horn the Hornby project, it's just really finding ways to improve the decoration site at the moment. Um, and everything, as you can see, things around me, the things that sort of go with that. Assembly is an area we're sort of trying to work on is an expert. That could be a great deal of fun, just taking what's inside a Skeletrix car. How did you first get involved in the project? It commenced by me going down to the factory on some factory visits in the late 80s when they still run these things and being frankly appalled at what I saw down at the factory where they worked. I came back here and was having some ideas of what could be done about their work down there. And my boss said to me, look, you know, we've got all this machinery, what can we do with it? And I jokingly at that point said, well, we can paint Skeletrix cars better than Hornby can, for one. And he said, well, go ahead and prove it. So, here we are. Despite growing competition, Scalextric has maintained its position as market leader. 
In fact, it has become the generic name for slot car racing as a whole. But just what will happen in the 90s and beyond? Future, future's good. As long as they keep making cars, we'll keep making scale extra. People want to simulate the real thing. We'll be there. I obviously run a shop and I know how much it sells, but it's not only the younger kids, it's the older ones as well. There's a lot of racing clubs getting about now. Still quite a competitive feel to it. And, uh, it's fun. <laughs> Um, well, many of the companies have tried to take off Scale Electric and haven't really made a very good job, but Scale Electric is the best.